Hello everyone. Welcome to NPTEL course on groundwater hydrology and management. This is week eight, lecture five. We have come to the end of the week eight, where we discussed about the types of wells. What are the issues between the wells? What type of construction is in the wells? And finally, what is the pumps that are being used? In today's lecture, we will look at the source of these pumps. Pump energy, okay. Um, this study has done a very good review of all the states in India or most of the states in India where agriculture is predominantly a livelihood option and they've made a map about groundwater irrigation. What they mention is from 1950 to 2010, the change is happening in what water they use for irrigation. Again, irrigation is only during the rabi and winter crops, which means there is water being pumped or used by surface dams and other resources to supplement the water for irrigation. It is not by rainfall. Okay, so that is the understanding which is clear. That is why you don't see rainfall here. When you say irrigated, you are applying water by using a different means and by spending energy. Could be gravity also when you call about canals and uh, dams. So you have your canals which has been increasing steadily, but then it started to taper off because that was a big dams era. A lot of dams were built, but after a lot of dams were built, there's not much space, options, budget that you can use for dams. Then you have tanks, which is also a surface water body, uh, not much increase and it has been almost coming down or uh, stabilizing. Whereas your tube wells and other groundwater wells have been increasing steadily. The tanks is in the uh, orange line. Whereas your other wells is the yellow, which starts to go up and come down uh, most probably. But your green line shows a very steady increase, which means a lot of tube wells, bore wells that we saw in the previous lecture have been used. So where does the energy come from? That is the uh, last uh, figure that you have here, which says about distribution of energy source as percentages. Uh, of the total, which is very interesting in India, of the total, more than 75% of the groundwater irrigation is done by electric pumps. Where is the energy coming from? How sustainable is the energy is all these questions. Please don't mix electric and solar pumps. Uh, because those uh, are totally two different entities here. When I talk about electricity, uh, it is mostly by the power which is generated by coal or nuclear power that is being supplied to the public by the government. Okay, so you have uh, these uh, bifurcations, and you could see that most of the uh, groundwater irrigation is by electric pump followed by diesel pump, which has been predominantly the pump in the older uh, days. And then you have little bit of manual or animal, which we saw the treadle pumps in the previous lecture. So those pumps are available. So what are the different energy sources? You have electric, electric pumps, diesel uh, pumps, uh, windmill, um, solar, manual, and animal hand pumps. Okay, all these are very important for your um, for your groundwater irrigation. Windmills are the wind uh, generated electric power which comes and takes your um, groundwater to a higher level for irrigation. Solar pumps are there and manual animal. So even though the wind and solar converts the solar energy or the wind energy into electric power, 
we are not mixing them as electric pumps. So clearly electric pumps are the pumps which get electricity from the grids um, and the grids are supplied power by the centralized power stations, which could be coal power station or your nuclear uh, uh, power stations. So in India, most of it is 75% of it is from your pumping source, which is uh, electricity. And then the remaining um, percentage mostly is diesel. So I would say diesel and electricity are the most uh, important sources in India. 75 and 25, 22%, there's a very, very less percent for uh, other sources. If you look at the states, individual states, before uh, we uh, jump in um, to the where water is being scarce, if you could look at mostly the regions where you have good access to power, they have electricity. So you can say Delhi, um, and then wherever you have good power stations, Madhya Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, you have a nuclear reactor. So all and at coal plants, right? So you have a lot of uh, power from electricity, very less diesel. So electricity on one hand is good for because it reduces the pollution, et cetera. Uh, but at one end uh, where the electricity is being generated, there is pollution, right? So for example, Neveli is the coal, um, uh, um, you know, uh, a thermal power plant in India powered by coal. Uh, but then it distributes to two, three states, the energy. So all these could be taken into account. Most importantly, what you other see is in regions where there's less electricity and accessibility to electricity, like high elevations and stuff, there your diesel pumps have worked well. Meghalaya, Bihar, Assam, all these locations, you have a good exercise. But before we look at the pump energy sources, it is important to compare this data along with the uh, water stress by WRI and the CGWB uh, groundwater maps. See uh, the paper diagram that we see uh, here, all these, uh, wherever groundwater irrigation is high, percentage of area, okay? Almost 100% of these areas are using groundwater. That is also the places which are highly groundwater depleted as per CGWB. So there is a correlation between the studies. There are three studies here. One is a study based on groundwater uh, data and irrigation uh, data, statistics from the agriculture department, where it talks about what is the uh, water used for irrigation and what are the acreages that is done. So here almost 100% of your area is dealt with groundwater irrigation. Whereas if you come here, it is a very less amount of um, groundwater irrigation on these sides. You could see that, but mostly your red matches with the blue in the uh, Mishra et al. paper. Uh, and the CGWB data clearly shows that the groundwater extraction is more than the recharge. So it is a critical phase for groundwater use. And then we have the water stress indicator, which sees that almost all these areas where the groundwater irrigation is happening, there is high to extremely high water stress uh, happening and going to happen in the future scenarios. So the pump energy sources tells a lot about the um, uh, government plans, the subsidies that are given for groundwater access, and also is it sustainable or not in the long run. So a uh, case across India, which is the total percentage, as I mentioned, is 75 plus percentage is used by electricity, uh, whereas your 25 percentage is used uh, for um, your uh, other resources, especially your diesel pumps. Uh, and um, case across intensive ag areas, so which is these are the intensive ag areas, but that is why you have 100% groundwater irrigation. So these states, Punjab, Rajasthan, Gujarat, if you see that all of them are using tremendously uh, electric pumps, okay? Tremendous power and also a lot of uh, groundwater use. 
you look at punjab gujarat rajasthan punjab gujarat rajasthan all same story haryana also so is this sustainable it is not then you come down to the southern india where you have some pockets of uh, groundwater irrigation uh, which are also matching here uh, tamil nadu uh, karnataka and and andhra regions you have good amount of electricity um, uh, tamil nadu also yeah so uh, this doesn't look good for groundwater irrigation uh, because uh, you're just exploiting the groundwater tamil nadu here so you're just exploiting the groundwater because you have good access to electricity uh, and also you are not concerning about how to use water well so water is just extracted and then used surplusly <coughs> moving on let's say what are the case in hard rock regions and which is very very important for the groundwater lecture we saw that all the central india let me draw it roughly for you uh, this central part of india has hard rock aquifers whereas your um, uh, your alluvium aquifers are here okay along the coast etc okay so in between is where your um, consolidated aquifers or hard rock aquifers are there and if you look at this region where you have extremely uh, 100% groundwater irrigation you could see that uh, maharashtra is there uh, maharashtra yeah electricity is high almost 90% electricity is uh, given for uh, pumps okay so um, remember that electricity is much easier to take especially with the rural electrification program and other schemes by the government it's easier to take it to the field rather than buying diesel taking it to the station um, refilling your uh, uh, diesel tanks and bringing it to the field think about how much expenses it is rather than you just pull a wire from your uh, grid and then you start your irrigation so uh, with with appropriate permissions i'm saying so electricity has given the ease of access to groundwater uh, and the pumps are becoming very very uh, efficient so there is tremendous use of groundwater but is it sustainable is again the question which from these uh, figures you see it is turning red it is not uh, um, uh, sustainable and the water stress data also says it is not sustainable so moving on what is the other case you we would like to see is the case in dry and arid regions such as the rajasthan belt uh, you could see in rajasthan uh, they use a lot of electricity but mostly also diesel because there's not much electricity availability good quality may be there so for that uh, there is some diesel pumps important as i said case in the hilly regions of uh, meghalaya here let me just tick it for you so on the same page tripura um it has a lot of electricity maybe hydropower but uh, you have your meghalaya assam all these places uh, where it is tremendously done by uttarakhand uh, jharkhand assam uh, bihar all these places have more use of diesel pumps okay and diesel it's not because diesel is cheap there it is much easier to take diesel rather than electricity because of the quality of electricity um, these uh, high hilly regions may not have good electric um, supply uh, in terms of um, quality to run the pumps remember that you should have a stable connection and the power supply should be good to sustain the pumps otherwise the pumps would go into repair uh, it will burn the coils will burn if too much power is there and or if it doesn't have enough power it will suffer it won't pull the water out so that is what we will see here gujarat telangana karnataka which are the uh, predominant uh, agricultural states including tamil nadu you see a lot of water is being pumped by electricity whereas the hilly regions of bihar west bengal or the east the eastern regions odisha uh, you have less electricity but more diesel pumps um, and manual and animal are uh, mostly available in the regions where the water depth is shallow for example the andaman and nicobar islands uh, the um, odisha uh, and jharkhand jharkhand would have a very uh, shallow aquifer because of the hilly uh, terrain 
all these places have very less okay uh, windmills solar pumps are coming but not as much as we need it uh, so that is a neat statement for the next um, future steps for the government to see can we have a renewable uh, less uh, environmental uh, polluting agents that can help irrigation with good power supply. So to occur this, as I said, not only that the availability of power and availability of pumps have helped the groundwater irrigation uh, in India, but most also the subsidies that are given by governments, uh, state and the central. Not a lot of people talk about this because it becomes um, a very interesting topic when we debate on how the subsidies should be dealt with. So if you look at this, uh, there are some states which give good subsidy and, and no subsidy. For example, Tamil Nadu has given a lot of subsidies for electricity and that's why you don't see a price. Uh, so the farmers might have different pumps. As I said, the pumps would differ based on the construction of the well dug well driven or drilled and also based on the use of the well which is domestic irrigation etc uh, but in this irrigation aspect all this is agriculture so the the uh, well also depends it if it is dug driven or drilled which means deep aquifer or shallow aquifer and the acreage what crops they grow so if you look at it here the most of the state governments have a same price for all the different pumps if it's two horsepower or 10 horsepower, how much they use is, um, we don't care about the pump, but you just pay uh, 50 pies, for example, in Haryana, 50 pies per kilowatt per hour, okay? Uh, which means at uh, if you any pump you use is fine for us. Most of the states are like that, except Assam puts a, a peak price on the 10 HPs uh, because it consumes more power, um, up, uh, more demands high quality power, right? 2000 kilowatt power. So um, with this, uh, you can only see that it is not the same across India. And that also drives the groundwater use and access across India, okay? So if I say this is the average, the average price a state has to pay, a state farmer has to pay is around 75 pies per kilowatt hour. Uh, I could see that most of the states are below that line. And I picked this just looking at uh, qualitatively looking at the graph okay and this is high this is low so somewhere around 75 pies uh, but then if you look at uh, most of the states three-fourths of the states uh, may be going up uh, slightly but most importantly Assam and West Bengal demand more price uh, for the pumping whereas uh, there are other states which take very very less so for example Punjab, Tamil Nadu, uh, Bihar, Gujarat all take less and interestingly these are also the same states that have high groundwater depletion so on one end there is good supply of electricity for example Tamil Nadu we have the power uh, stations both coal and nuclear uh, reactors uh, so there is good power supply which aids more groundwater use however there is also a lower price for the power that is used for agriculture. And that is where most energy would be used for groundwater. You cannot get diesel cheaper just because you would use it for agriculture. It's easy to use it differently. You say that, no, I have a diesel pump. I will buy the diesel and use it here in the diesel pump for agriculture, but you can always leak it, use it for others. Whereas a power line, a power line will go to your uh, uh, to your uh, farm and there the connection is taken so thereby you're reducing the um, point of theft but still you would see some people building a house right next to the farm uh, and then they lose the, both the same connections uh, together but it's not going to be a big uh, uh, theft a small small uh, electricity thefts do occur but the point here is there are subsidies and because of subsidies, there is more groundwater irrigation as per the maps. Other subsidies also may exist. For example, crop uh, subsidies, um, fertilizer subsidies, uh, seed subsidies, uh, horticulture subsidies, et cetera, et cetera. Labor subsidies, Mandriga money is used for some states as labor subsidies, et cetera. And these improve or increase the acreage for groundwater irrigation is it sustainable or not is the question okay 
yeah, you have money to um, put more crops per area. Uh, you have the water, is it sustainable? Can you do it now? And can you do it every year is the question. So uh, I will uh, discuss one important uh, aspect about renewable energy for solar for uh, groundwater pumps, which is solar for pumping and solar crops. This concept is uh, pretty much pushed a lot in Indian government through the NGOs like IMI, Urja, etc. Let's see what it is. Solar powered pumps used in domestic water supply, irrigation, and it comes in different sizes. So take an example uh, from the World Bank uh, blog, you have solar, which is uh, being used to generate power through solar panels. It goes into these boxes where it converts the power and then runs the motor. So here's the pump, which pumps the water into a tank and it is used for domestic. So if it is not used for domestic, if you don't have a tank, just draw it. If you don't have a tank, this water can be applied to this field. Okay. And that is irrigation. So both ways, your solar power can be used for groundwater domestic use and irrigation. Irrigation, not much because you have very low power solar uh, pumps, but and science and technology is improving. So sooner or later, you'll have high pumps. Right now, you don't see that for uh, industrial um, water use, but you see for industrial power use. For example, uh, you know, these big companies would have solar panels on top and that energy is used for lighting the factories, running some machinery, those kind of things. So does this uh, stop here? Because you have some solar uh, um, panels and this lady, as you see, is uh, using that to pump water for agriculture. And you have books, good books, which says uh, some model uh, standards for using small scale solar uh, pumps uh, for uh, drip irrigation and, and conserving water. Urja is another NGO which works, as you could see, for communal farming. So all the five farmers would come and then put money for a solar power plant like this. The power is kept within the system. You use the power, you pump the water, you supply it for the five farmers which put money for the solar and you share the profits. Okay, uh, But what are solar crops? So there is solar pumps for crops. What, what do you mean by solar crops? This is the interesting part where a farmer may not grow the crop, but just use the solar panels for generating power, which could be sold. Let me draw this concept. Okay, you have a land and you put solar panel here. Okay, so you have solar panels uh, here. And uh, using that solar panel, you put water into this field. Okay. Now, if you don't have enough labor to do the farming and or like see you can see the farmer is a woman and same here there's no crops crops are growing on the side because your solar panels would limit the sunlight and also the height of the plant growth you're not going to put a couple of feet high you're going to put very low so that uh, energy hits and then drives your power systems so this is the concept where slowly farmers are, in, are understanding that the power is good in solar uh, panels uh, and I don't need that much power. I put the panels, but I don't need it every day because during the rainfall season, what happens? You don't need uh, solar, you don't need groundwater. So if you don't need groundwater, you don't need solar energy to pump. So here's a concept where water uh, is um, um, used only in the groundwater irrigation season and the remaining part, the solar panels will still collect because there's sunlight it will still collect power and push it to the grid for power supply. And this is also accepted in uh, modern day terms, in, especially in, in places where the farmers cannot do so farming, age, migration, or other issues. Um, and there is a need for excessive solar power. So what happens to the excessive solar power is a question. As I said, your demand for, uh, uh, let's say that this is your uh, cropping calendar uh, and your groundwater need is only during your 
ground water uh, season which is your uh, rabi season and some in the winter now most probably from may or april to june after that you have for example in maharashtra i'm saying april to june and then after that you have good rainfall it will be really uh, not efficient if you have rainfall and ground water right because you have enough rain coming so why do you use ground water so at that point your solar panels your solar panel use here and here is is not much you don't use it if you're only driving a pump but think about taking the power and putting it into a grid and that is what uh, ngos have been working now for example imi and i'll show you a case study what happens to the excess power so this is the case study as per well, wle imi which i said uh, it is in december most of the uh, groundwater uh, irrigation happens and so your use the power use is full okay so here's your um, um, how about how you could sell it after you uh, take the power and what do you do with the surplus uh, power so you you see here that in the lean season this is where there's no rainfall okay so in the lean season you have uh, all the solar power converted into groundwater irrigation which means the kilowatt generated is equal to the kilowatt used in irrigation and most of the water is used uh, for groundwater irrigation so the, the solar panel collects the power the power is put into the groundwater pump and the groundwater pump puts water in the land your cycle is closed in may june july august during your uh, slowly your um, season of monsoon because june the monsoon starts you could see that the solar power is there and these are the regions where some solar power is still needed uh, so the solar power partly is only giving uh, power to the pumps whereas the remaining is given by rainfall okay there's good rainfall so water is being given what happens to the excess power that is generated why do you have the cyclic pattern you have the cyclic pattern because the solar radiation is not the same every month it is hotter when you go in summer whereas it is not that hot when you go in december so depending on the solar radiation your power generation happens so that is why you see a cyclic pattern like this now your groundwater irrigation follows this cyclic pattern but which is in blue but now there is some excess of power generator which is green what happens to that you put it or you sell it to the grid you give it to the grid and the grid is now connected to all the villages and cities so your solar power in, are being fed into the grid for supply so initially you have system where there is a, a big uh, factory which is producing power and then it sends to grids which are placed in villages okay so the power comes to grids and then your farm is getting irrigated but now so this farm is getting irrigated now because of solar the solar panel is there you are putting power back to the grid and then it goes into the cities if but mostly in the villages at least it will be used because all farmers may not have uh, solar uh, power so this is how the government has uh, included uh, the farmers in uh, producing power for themselves and the excess power they could sell it's like your milk cooperative you have cows you uh, take the milk from the cow for your consumption whatever is excess you give it to the cooperative and there's no particular rule you have to give every day one liter for example tomorrow i have guest coming my cow milk is only enough for me and my guest so i will not sell the milk to the cooperative it will be zero but in other uh, scenarios when my 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 relatives are not there then i would give more milk if my cow is good and she gives more milk i give more milk so all these are similar patterns like a cooperative thing and this is uh, picking uh, up speed uh, for solar which is uh, being used for groundwater irrigation and also a mechanism to generate power for um, the grid so with this we would come to the end of the week 8 uh, i'll just recap quickly what we looked at we looked at the well types uh, ranging from the uses domestic irrigation and industry we looked at the well types depending on the construction which is dug well driven or drilled well dug well is shallow driven as you hit lightly so it is between the 
shallow and the deep aquifer and drill is you push it through a bore uh, in a machinery and that is mostly in the deep aquifers uh, we talked about well interferences so it's not only the well type and well use but how the pump pushes the water or uh, extracts the water is very important for bringing down the water table in the entire village uh, and for access of water from the wells we looked at well pumps and what are the energies for the pumps and subsidies so subsidies are good but it may not be good for sustaining your groundwater sustainability with this i would conclude today's lecture thank you